And welcome back to 110 Daily. Josh and Chris here with you on a Friday. All right, Chris, it's that time we use our manners and talk about things we want to talk about. It is humor me, please. What do you have for us today? Yes, uh, I'm going to use my manners and say humor me, please, especially because I actually have I'm trying to cheat today. And even though I'm using my manners because I want to I want to talk about two things real quickly. Um, the first is the injury to Colin Gillespie for Villanova, uh, the star point guard for them out for the remainder of the season due to a torn MCL uh, injury that occurred for him against Creighton on Wednesday night. And just really tough to see for the senior three-year starter. And as Jay Wright put it, the heart and soul of that program. His numbers alone don't really tell the full story because you look at that uh, you look at his numbers, and I was a little bit, I was like, wow, only 3.3 rebounds, 4.7 assists, 14.4 points. That seems lower than I would have expected be because he's making an impact beyond those numbers. He's just a perfect fit. He's been a perfect fit for that system. Assist rate, by far the highest on that team. And there's no clear, proven backup, obvious backup yeah. to run the point for the Wildcats. The bulk of their ball handling responsibilities are likely going to fall to Justin Moore, who is coming off of a great game against Creighton. They also have some options that they can shift around. In fact, in the middle of this game, uh, because Moore was in foul trouble, I believe Jeremiah Robinson so, Earl right. actually took the yeah. point mid game, which was weird. It sounds though like that's not going to be the, the norm. Um, it's going to be a lot for this team to overcome. And I'm curious as far as what you think about this, Josh, because they obviously have a challenging road ahead. This is a team that not long ago, I was saying, well, maybe if things go right, they could be that fourth number one seed. That ship is long <laughs> sailed. Um, and I'm conflicted on my view on this team because they haven't been doing great of late. They've struggled on the road in particular. This is a team where I could see them disappointing come the NCAA tournament and then just not having enough, not being able to overcome. But this is also a team where I also think they really have that next man, next man up mentality um, where I could see them sort of, going further than you'd expect them to go with this injury and, and how their season's gone. So I'm sort of conflicted on what this means for them, what this could mean for them, what to think of them about uh, how they could perform come the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I want, to, I want to see what they look like in the Big East tournament. It is incredibly difficult to reinvent your team on the fly in March. That's what they have to do. And because here's the reality of the situation. Colin Gillespie is way more valuable to Villanova than I would assume it is to Illinois. Because yeah, yeah. Illinois has Trent Frazier. And Trent Frazier was the best player or second best player on that team before Desumu got there. He can mm -hmm. go do what he did against Michigan because he's done it multiple times. He's, he's used to it. That was his responsibility before Desumu showed up. Like you said, Villanova doesn't have that guy. Gillespie and... It's not that I think Gillespie is a better player than Desumu, but he's way more valuable because of the situation and the responsibility he has. I yeah, I'm concerned. I'm curious to see what the NCAA tournament selection committee does with this too. If they if yeah. they get punished, quote unquote punished for losing Gillespie, I feel like they could very easily overachieve. But if sure, they're gonna be a point. if they're gonna be a three seed, I don't like their chances of living up to that. I think mm -hmm. they're a top 16, top 25 team without him, not a top 15 team. I guess I'll put it that way. Yeah. The, the, the potential silver lining here, I guess, is that since he's now done for the season mm -hmm. and he's not a surefire first-round NBA draft pick, this mm -hmm. could increase the likelihood that he comes back next season with this blanket extra year of eligibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, maybe he was ready to, and I mean, maybe he would have come back anyway because it's not like the NBA is waiting for him. Right. I don't know where his head was at. He's probably not even worried about that at this moment in time. But now that you're going to sit there and you're going to watch your team go through the NCAA tournament, you haven't gotten to play two years in a row now. Maybe that means we get another year of Colin Gillespie in college basketball or makes it more likely at least. Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely going to be something to watch. That's, there's, a number of key players who are dealing with injuries now who are like maybe out or were out for the rest of the season who I'm going to be interested to see what their decision making process is when it comes mm -hmm. to if they use that next that year of eligibility or not. Um, I have one more humor me please here because this one I want to uh, discuss 
the Illinois, the Illini, uh, the Illinois basketball team, because I need to give a little bit of a, not an apology, not a walk back, but I just sort of need to acknowledge some ways I think I was a little bit unfair to them. Um, I think I need to get past a little hurdle that had formed in my mind about exactly how good or exactly the likelihood of Illinois' upside coming to fruition. I never really doubted the upside with this team, but I think I was what I was doubting and what I had sort of capped off is the probability that we would see that upside at the right time or the probability that they would reach that upside. And I'm really thinking I need to reconsider. They obviously we talked about Michigan's side of of their game, the game that the, those two teams played earlier this week, and obviously part of it was just nothing was going right for Michigan in this game. But also, Illinois took down a team on the road, a Michigan team that we had basically nothing but praise for at the time, by twenty three without Dasunmu, their biggest win against a top two team since nineteen sixty four. It was incredibly impressive and it sort of opened my eyes and sort of a reminder to me that obviously it's not a reminder of how good they can be, but sort of a reevaluation of, you know, the odds that they could end up continuing this kind of stretch and continue this into the NCAA tournament are higher than I've been giving them credit for. I had sort of put up this, you know, wall in my mind of how high their probability could be. Be. They were a team that if they make the Final Four, I could see them going all the way. But what are the chances they run into trouble along the way? And I'm starting to think those chances are a bit lower. I'm not saying that they couldn't still run into hit a snag, but, you know, I just was so impressed with what I saw from Michigan that it sort of made me look at their record, at their resume. You know, in this game in particular, you know, Brad Underwood had set this goal. You know, I did a little reading about it. Brad Underwood had set this goal of he wanted to develop this team that is capable of winning on the road, even when shots aren't falling. And that means elite defense, it means toughness, it means rebounding. And they did all of that against Michigan, and they made the shots. And that's how this game ended up being, but by such a, a big uh, margin. But even if their shots weren't falling at that rate, mm-hmm. all those other things would have led them to winning this game, and it would have been closer. Yep. They out rebounded the Wolverines by sixteen. Mm-hmm. Nearly you know, doubled I, them I up. Think nearly doubled them up. I mean, it was incredibly impressive, and I think I sort of need to acknowledge that this team can be more multi-dimensional than I give them credit for, and the chances that this team can continue on a run—not a run exactly like this—but what they've done without Dasunmu has made me realize I need to give them a little bit more credit. Now, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm you know you know, promoting them to the number three team. They're right there with Baylor. Let's, you know, jump on that bandwagon to that level. But I think I need to give them a little bit more respect that they can do more things than I give them credit for and that the chances that they can continue to perform at a high level are much greater than I've given them credit for. My question is pretty simple, and it's can they blend these really good performances they're getting with Desumu when he comes back? Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Trent Frazier has spent all season being that third guy and taking a step back because he's yeah. not as good as Dasunmu and Dasunmu needs the ball in his hands. Mm-hmm. That part I'm not as concerned about, but also talking about Andre Corbello. The problem mm-hmm. Illinois has sometimes is that if Dasunmu is not great and has a bad game, you look at the rest of the stat sheet and outside of Kofi Coburn, nobody's really doing much. If you get Curbelo to go give you spurts like he had at the beginning of that Michigan game where he looked like the best player on the floor for five minutes and had something like eight quick points, Mm -hmm. then that gives you the ability to compensate for a bad game from Dasunmu. But the the usage rates are going to go way down when Dasunmu comes back. Sure. This team is much more talented, I think, than some people give it credit for from an all-around perspective. The problem mm-hmm. is you don't get to see all of it. So can you get the best versions of all, or the at least an efficient version of all of these guys where they're all doing something productive at the same time? It's a right. difficult puzzle to fit together. And I know Josh has been harping on this all year, but you just go look at their bad games. And that's a lot of the story of it. They are so reliant on those two guys. It's not, it's not that they don't have other guys that can go step up. It's just they haven't really found a way... When, again, we're, we're pulling hairs here. They're the fourth best team in the country. Mm-hmm. I firmly believe right. that. But yeah. 
when you're talking about against a comparing of against a Michigan or a Baylor or something, the the role players have not been as consistent. Desumu mm-hmm. and Coburn have been better than any two players on those teams, but that's the that's the flip side of it. So that's what I'm curious about is does a full season now and a little bit more responsibility give Corbello more confidence? Does Trent Frazier go, okay, I've, I've remembered how to be the guy, so if I need to go take a game over, I can do that. How does this look mm-hmm. when Desumu comes back? I'm very curious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's going to be the the key factor for them. I don't I don't think I've seen, I looked it up last night, any information about whether he's going to be in their game against Ohio State this weekend or not. So that's one I'm definitely keeping my eye on to see if, if he does come back. I, I want to see him back because I want to see him back, but also mm-hmm. I want to see, like just like you said, how does it fit? with the strides that they've made with how they performed in his absence. So, yeah, uh, I, I yeah. think he's, I think he's day to day kind of, cause he was in concussion yeah. protocol, I believe. So it's sort of a, right. where, what are the tests looking like? How's he feeling kind of thing? So, yeah, I think there's a chance he plays. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting. What do you have? Humor me, please. While we talk about this newest report related to Russell Wilson, cause I didn't get a chance to talk about it last week and I want to talk about mm-hmm. it. Let's do so, it. So Diana Rossini went on the Pat McAfee show and said that the Seahawks are taking calls on Russell Wilson. Not that they're actively mm-hmm. shopping him, but that they are listening. Mm-hmm. Nobody else with a quarterback like Russell Wilson is fielding calls on the quarterback. <laughs> no. That's that's not happening. Yeah. The Chiefs are yeah. not the the Chiefs are not <laughs> figuring out what somebody might be willing to give up for Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, that's the, not a good use of their time. Right. The Bills are not interested in exploring packages for Josh Allen. The mm-hmm. Ravens, Lamar Jackson. You can go down the list. This is not This is noteworthy. And more than just... Of course, it's not surprising because of the situation, right? There's context mm-hmm. here that is important to understand. They just didn't, yeah. out of the blue, decide to start fielding calls on Russell Wilson. <laughs> but... Mm-hmm. What it shows me is that Pete Carroll and this front office are not determined to make this work, right? This is the opposite of the Houston Texans who have a quarterback who has explicitly asked to be traded and said, yeah, we're not doing that. We look forward to Deshaun being our quarterback. Mm-hmm. This is, Russell Wilson hasn't asked for a trade and they're listening and seeing what might be out there if they decide to pull the trigger. Which goes to this larger point that is what I really want to get to here and I want to get your thoughts on. Mm-hmm. There are clear philosophical differences between Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll. Oh, yeah. In terms of how this offense is supposed to operate, what this team should do, the identity of this team, which is one of the more interesting aspects of that athletic article for me, that Pete Carroll has in a, Pete Carroll knows how he wants his team to operate. And Russell Wilson mm-hmm. is not interested in operating a team that way because it limits what he can do as a passer. Mm-hmm. Which means... That for this to work and for them to be able to fix the problems that they currently have, somebody has to have a change of heart and say, you know what? I don't care enough about having my way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound like the Seahawks are doing anything on that regard. They're listening to trading to trade offers. Yeah. Which means it would probably have to fall on Russell Wilson and say, you know, that's my bad. I shouldn't have said anything. But I don't think that's happening because there is nothing accidental about what Russell Wilson has done. Russell Wilson spent years saying nothing. Right. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely He's saying something. Nothing. It's, it's well thought right. out. Yeah. Right. It was not an accident. He went on the Dan Patrick show and talked about needing better offensive line play and better protection. It is not an accident. He stopped saying go Hawks at the end of his press availabilities. None of this is coincidental. He knows exactly what he is doing, which tells me he is rather dug in as well. Not Deshaun Mm -hmm. Deshaun Watson dug in, probably. But everything that keeps coming just makes me feel more and more like this is not a... We're not to the point where it is a completely irreconcilable relationship. I don't even know if that's a word. But... (laughs) Something has to change and the trajectory needs to change for this to end in anything other than a trade because they, they're they going farther apart, not trying to work on a solution together. There is no meeting Russell Wilson halfway here going on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, 
I mean, I'm right there with you. I, I don't see, especially when it comes to with Russell Wilson, like you said, he, he's not going to just he's not someone like he's like you said there were years where he was not he was not complaining he was not saying anything so what's happened with him has been very strategic it was not a oh i'm frustrated and i'm doing a you know an interview when i accidentally let i, I let that slip and i didn't mean to be that frustrated and oh no i gotta walk it back like mm-hmm. no this is all like you said it's all very strategic and he's definitely a guy where like this has to have been bubbling under the surface for an extensive amount of time this oh, yeah. is not something where oh, he wasn't saying anything because everything was going great all the time. And now when things started to get hard, now he's upset. It is not that. It is, this has been bubbling under the surface for a long time. And he's decided that he can't just keep, you know, sitting there thinking things are going to change because it's clear things are not going to change from an organizational standpoint, which is why he's taken the stance he has. And then, like you said, on the other side, there's no... I just I'm I'm sort of baffled, and Josh and I talked about this last weekend, uh, last last week. Um, part of me is baffled that the team has not realized that it's you know has not taken the approach of let's try to smooth this over. Mm-hmm. I know, and it's like, and I mean, I guess we don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but there's no evidence uh, that the team is actually actively working to try to smooth this over. You know, like, and smoothing this over could work so many could 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 happen in so many different ways in terms of and i'm not even saying it would work but right there could be an approach to the organization that we're going to meet you halfway or it could just be let's try to smooth these smooth things over from a communication standpoint because there's the disconnect about how the team should actually function in terms of what their what their uh, priorities are uh, how they their system works but then there's just a a lack of respect that it sounds like russell wilson feel feels with his input not being taken mm-hmm. and you know, could there be some sort of halfway solution where the organization doesn't necessarily give a lot to what he wants, but at least tries to make it, tries to actually take a little, like show him that they care by trying to take a little bit of his input, trying to involve him more. They just don't like, I mean, you could try to do some steps, even if you're not willing to make some sort of huge concession to the way that your offense is shaped you could still try to bring him into matters more. I I guess we're past that point at this point. I mean, it seems like we're, we're clearly past this point. And, and now there's just, like you said, I don't really see very many with every new report that comes out, nothing has come out. That's made me think, Oh man, definitely a trade now. No other way. It's gotta be a trade, but there's also, we're, we're getting farther apart so that I'm not sure how the recipe for them somehow working this out just seems to be getting farther away and I'm not seeing a path back, even though they necessarily haven't gotten so far apart, right? This isn't a Deshaun Watson with the Texan situation. They haven't gotten that far apart that it's impossible. But even as we inch farther apart, rather than, you know, like jump further apart, as the gap between these two sides continues to slow, even if it's slowly growing, it, there's no reason for you to think it's going to turn around. I, I and They're going to come back together. There's just not... I, I, there's not anything there. So I'm sort of with you in that camp completely. It feels to me like Russell Wilson tried to have conversations and tried to do this internally mm-hmm. and then reached a point, fair or not, whatever, who knows exactly everything that went down, but where sure. he said, I'm not, I'm not trying to do this anymore. You're clearly mm-hmm. just not going to listen to me. So if that's the choice you're going to make and the way you're going to approach things, then I want out. Or mm-hmm. at least I'm going to make... I, he hasn't officially asked for a trade. I'm going to publicly declare my dissatisfaction for the way that you are handling things. And now the Seahawks mm-hmm. are apparently mad at him for doing that, which again just goes to them digging into their side of this and not really showing any yeah. interest in trying to patch it up. Because it's... It's not like this is the first time a quarterback and a team have had issues. There's nothing yeah, right. There's nothing comp- really noteworthy in the some of the events that have transpired and specifically what was in that athletic article. But why do you start writing the athletic article? You write the athletic article because all of a sudden these two sides are so far apart that something must have happened. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't think there was that much noteworthy 
They talked about the Richard Sherman blow up in practice again, but all that other stuff. I don't know if you if you've read the athletic article, but mm-hmm. it just felt like a lot of that's not that big of a deal until you get to this point. Right. Okay. He walked out. He apparently stormed out of a meeting. It happens. If they patch things up the next day, it's not a big deal. You don't need to go digging for that. Right. But when that is then followed up by where we are now, it is a big deal because that tells you Mm -hmm. he was frustrated back then, which goes to the point of that sort of we both just made about, right, this isn't new. I think he just reached a breaking point where he said, I'm going public. I've tried to do this quote unquote professionally or tried to handle it the best way I thought and keeping it internal and trying to explain to you why I'm frustrated and Mm -hmm. seeing what we can do. And you just don't want to, engage in that conversation so i'm gonna go tell dan patrick that i'm upset with my protection that we need to do a better job and we're gonna take this thing public yeah and i just i just wonder in situations like this what is the seahawks plan like if everything goes great like reasonably you know i guess obviously they would love it if if russell wilson you know just sort of walked back things and said okay never mind but Realistically speaking, they have to know that that's not likely to happen. So, what is their, what is their, um, most realistic, perfect plan? Like, what? How, how does this end? Like, what is the strategy? Like, what? How do you see this playing out if you're the Seahawks? Because you have to be both sides here have to be making their individual moves and decisions based on a long, some sort of long term plan. Where do you see this go? Like, how do you see this ending well for you? That's mm-hmm. the part that I, I don't understand. How do you see this working out? I, I, I guess is the part that I always, when teams in situations like this, where I just, I don't know how you see the, there has to be somebody in that front office in, in a position of power who sees this ending well for this team, right? Mm-hmm. Or, at least, right or at least they think so. Right. The, the other part of this I don't get, Pete Carroll's what, 69? If I'm not mistaken, uh, something like something like that, yeah. Obviously, just signed a contract extension, but you're telling me, yeah, sixty nine, yeah. Y- th- this is the point where you want to go trade your top five quarterback, arguably top three, mm-hmm. still in his prime. Who, if Tom Brady and Drew Brees are any in- any indication, could be playing at a high level for another five plus years. You want to trade him now? To a t- in theory, to a team that doesn't have a quarterback to give you back. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess if if you that's think a good point, yeah. Now, if you're all in on this this group of quarterback prospects that are available in the draft, and you can find a way to get a top ten pick, mm-hmm. then and you think Mac Jones, Trey Lance, whoever is your guy, then okay. I yeah yeah, but. I am not confident that, or Justin Fields, whoever, Zach Wilson, that that guy is going to make you a Super Bowl contender. He's right. not going to be better than Russell Wilson. He's not. Right. Things are going to have to go very, very, very well. You have to be incredibly confident. Things have to go perfectly with one of those guys for you to be in a good position. Right. It, if it was a young coach, where, right, sort of like the, the Lions are doing. Okay, mm-hmm. you signed Dan Campbell to this massive contract, six years or five years or whatever it is. Clearly, mm-hmm. they're do- they're not interested in the short term, which is fine. So then right. you can do things like experiment with Jared Goff, trade Matthew Stafford, take on Goff's contract, get a couple first rounders. You don't have mm-hmm. the sense of urgency. But when it's Pete Carroll and it's the Seahawks, you can't be bad for five years and then go start <laughs> working and build yourself up to being a Super Bowl contender again. Right. That goes against everything this organization has been during Pete Carroll's tenure. To your mm-hmm. point about what what is the end game here? Are they trying? I mean, the only solution I feel like is to get Deshaun Watson. <laughs> maybe yeah. Uh, maybe that's the. Can we get enough for Russell Wilson to go give to Houston? But you got to convince Houston to trade him. And if Houston's going <laughs> to yeah. trade him, you're going to get into a bidding war because other teams are going to want him too because he's also a top five quarterback. I, right. It's very, I just, the right, to your point, the idea mm-hmm. that they would rather explore trades 
then figure out a way to make this work or show any effort whatsoever mm-hmm. with the way that and it's not like that's a mind-blowingly good roster right you can't just plug a dude in at quarterback right this isn't like the, the colts where you just want a dude and they might be good with they just add a dude like right. it's not that good of a right a supporting cast you don't right you don't need an upgraded quarterback to make your team a super bowl contender that's not what this is right I, right it's very confusing i find this fascinating it is it's i i wonder how fast we're gonna it's one of those things where right like is it gonna take eight more steps in the wrong direction before something ends up happening Ooh. or could we blink and there's been some resolution to this really quickly I, one way or another i don't know it'll be interesting i i wouldn't be shocked if he's traded in the next week yeah yeah but we'll see we're gonna take another yeah. quick break when we come back Look ahead to the weekend. Best, most interesting games to keep your eye on. You are watching 110 Daily on the 110 Sports Network.